Thank you. Good morning. Um, this is an interesting uh, topic to cover because, I mean, just in her introductions, she mentioned psychic and how much of what happens at the ARE deals with Edgar Casey and deals with that opening of that inner eye, that psychic connection, that being more open or seeing or reading and being able to read other people. But what I have learned as a therapist, now my background is in neuropsychology. So my background is neuropsych, um, physiopsych. So it's a very, I guess, standard kind of education. But my interests have always been towards the spiritual and towards the psychic. So part of my interest is let's take a moment and set the mood here. What if all of this is real? What if all of the psychic things we're trying to do are actually real? What if people really are psychic? What if we really can see and read? So let's take a moment and I'd like to get everybody to focus, if you would. This lecture will end with a group hypnosis because that is my training. But I also want to start with a little bit of a meditation. So, if you would, make yourself comfortable. Okay? Kick off your shoes if you want to. Close your eyes. And take a moment and allow your thoughts to drift inwards. And for the first time in maybe a long time, I'd like you to notice what it feels like to breathe. Take in a nice, long, slow, deep breath. Just breathing in And exhale. Again, breathe in and let it go. Now take in a very deep breath and hold it for a moment. And notice what it feels like to relax and let it go. Now take all of your consciousness, take it deep inside, take it into your heart. And in the center of your heart, I want you to imagine Pretend, create a glowing flicker of light in the center of your heart. Come on in. And allow this little flame in the center of your heart to represent your mind-body connection the connection of your mind to your physical body, to however you understand creation, God. And breathe life into that light. 
Breathe it in. And exhale. Take it in. And let it go. Now with your next breath, Spread that light until it fills your entire chest. And picture it filling your whole chest. This is your mind-body connection. Your place in the universe. Now expand that light a little further. Take it down your arms and legs. Imagine this glowing light within your body. Fills you from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. From fingertip to fingertip. Completely all around you. Now recognize that this is your power, your connection with creation. So expand this light now to within arm's length of the body. Above, below, to the left and right, all around, underneath and through the floor, Create this protective shield around you. Recognize that this is your place in the world. This body is yours. So allow nothing to affect it, influence it, or come into it. This is your protective shield. So create this glowing kind of eggshell of light around your body. This is the distance between you and the rest of the universe. Your protective shield. Now I want you to bring you back, back to full consciousness. As I count from three to one. Three, taking a nice deep breath. Two, coming back. One. Wide awake and feeling good. And bring yourself all the way back. You see, the interesting thing and the reason that I actually did this talk, I did this talk originally for the uh, bookstore on one of their uh, Saturday workshops, Psychic Fairs, which is to talk about protection. We talk so much and we do so many workshops and there's so many books about opening up your inner eye and about becoming more psychic. But how often do we talk about how to make sure that I'm okay? and that I'm going to be safe opening up this eye and going out there. So that's what I kind of wanted to talk about today. Um, the thing is, is that opening up the psychic eye is kind of like awakening from a dream. You see, once you open that eye, you can't go back. It's like waking up from a dream. You can't go back into your dream. So once you begin to see and feel and experience, you're there. So how do we be aware of this and how do we take care of ourselves? The importance of protection. I want to tell you about what really got me interested in this topic. A client. 
and I've been a therapist now for over 25 years. My client meditated and worked on opening up her psychic eye for 10 years. And for 10 years, she meditated next to her mother who was in a coma. So her mother's in a coma and she meditates, trying to find her in this coma. So she spends 10 years every day, like clockwork, going to the hospital, sitting next to her mother and meditating, trying to find where she is consciously. Well, after 10 years, she never succeeded in finding her mother's consciousness or bringing her back. But what did she do? She opened up her psychic eye to such a degree that the trees talked to her. The dogs talked to her. Flowers talked to her. Rocks talked to her. Everything that is filled with life seemed to talk with her. She never worked on an off switch. She only worked on the on, on how to open up and to become more. So she never worked on closing that off. So every day she searched and searched with just, you know, this dedication. So opening an inner spiritual vision never taking care to protect herself, never taking the moment to make sure that she could cut it off and trying to figure out how to cut it off. I think so many people work on cutting on that inner eye and opening up that inner eye, but they don't focus on how do we back things back down. And how do we take control of that and bring it back in? So, opening an inner spiritual vision, but never taking care of herself. Now, I'm a scientist. So when I look at these topics, I still look at them from the perspective of being a scientist. Okay. Cyril Karl Popper, 1940s, modernized science. He proposed that as a scientist, we should be falsificationists. You don't prove anything in science. We only disprove. So we set up a hypothesis and we try to prove it wrong. And that's how I look at this whole spiritual world, is to kind of set up that hypothesis and prove it wrong. But when I look at this, let's pose for a moment that all of this is real, okay? All of psychic is real. All of Casey's readings are real. Past lives are real. The spiritual world around us is real. Let's just cite and set up that hypothesis that all of that around us is real. And what does that mean if we really look at it there? What are these consciousnesses we're talking to? When we do a reading, and when we get a, a reading on a person, what are we talking to? 
What is this from? Edgar Casey says that an entity is a soul. It's a spark or portion of the whole, the cause or purpose. So when the body physical lays aside the material body, that is what the physical called the soul, which becomes the body, which becomes an entity. So the soul is the body or the spiritual essence of an entity manifested in this material plane. So when the soul departs from the body, it has all the form of the body which it has passed yet it is not visible to the mind so it's passed beyond unless the mind has been and is att attuned to recognizing these things so then it appears in an infinite as that which may be handled with the attributes of a physical being and may still have the appetites of a physical being, the desires. What does that mean when Casey says that? Well, I think what it means and what I've seen and what I've worked with is when we start to open our mind up to other consciousnesses and trying to read a different consciousness or see a different consciousness, we're also opening ourselves up to something else to come towards us, which can potentially connect or stay with us afterwards. The soul looks through the eyes of the body. It handles with the emotions of the sense of the touch. It may be aware through the factors of these things in every sense. A little history, okay, as we talk about consciousness here and about opening our mind up to multiple consciousnesses. One of those is William James. Now, William James, if you study psychology, if you think you have come up with a theory that is new, if you think you've come up with a theory that is unique, if you think you've figured out something nobody else has ever figured out before, Read William James, because he kind of covered all of it. <laughs> he covered the cognitive revolution that happened in the 70s, and he wrote this in the 1890s. He, he wrote about pretty much all of it. I mean, he really did nail it quite well. What was interesting, though, is William James, in his 1896 lectures, I know, that's awful. Um, spoke on demonical possession. Spoke on demonical possession. Recapitulating the previous lectures on multiple personalities. He mentioned three types of mutations in the sense of the self. Insane, synambulistic, hysteric. The fourth time he said is spirit control or mediumship. So even in the field of science, okay, one of our founders in psychology talked 
about mediumship, which in the past has been equated with diabolical worship, with fear, with control, and worries of things like possession. Pathology. History shows that mediumship is almost identical with possession. Okay. How many of you have worked with somebody or have gotten a reading or wanted to get a reading? Well, where does that information come from? And how does it come into and through you or through that person if it's real? Because if it's real, it means something is actually physically going through you. This is something to think about. So, the obsolescence of public belief and possession is a strange thing in the world of Christianity. When one considers that it is the one of the most articulately expressed doctrines of both Testaments, Old Testament and New Testament, and reigned within our beliefs for hundreds of years has hardly changed. Every land and every age has exhibited the facts on which this is founded in India, China, Egypt, Africa, Polynesia, Greece, Rome, and all of medieval Europe believed that certain nervous disorders were of a supernatural origin, inspired by spirit. So the initial belief when it comes to psychology was that psychological disorders were by something outside that we had let in. And that's what I'm talking about with spiritual protection, is not letting it in. It's about being aware, being alert, being focused. When the pagans' gods, when the pagan gods became demonic in belief, all possessions became diabolical. Now, William James suggested that if there are devils, if there are supernormal powers, it is through the cracked and fragmented self that they enter. So they come into a person's consciousness when we are broken, when we are emotionally weak, and then we leave ourselves open. Does that make sense? Now, what William James went on to say is the refusal of modern enlightenment to treat possession as a hypothesis, as in, could this be something else? An extra consciousness around you. Is this all real? Okay, again, is this all real? So, the refusal of modern enlightenment to treat possession as a hypothesis, to be spoken of as even possible, in spite of the 
massive human tradition based on concrete experience in its favor. As in when we look at human experience through time, these things have shown up over and over again. It's always seemed to me to be almost a curious example of the power in the fashion of things once we put them under the microscope of science. That the demon theory will have its innings again to the mind, that other entities may come back into our mind and torment us. It's possible. One has to be scientific indeed, according to William James, to be blind and ignorant enough to suspect that it's impossible that there is no other consciousness. Because, I mean, where do we go? You know, we have consciousness, we have thought. Well, when we pass, where did that consciousness go? And that's what William James is questioning here. So where do we go? What happens next? Science on entity attachment and possession. Dr. Ralph Allison is considered a pioneer in the modern treatment of multiple personality disorder. He says bluntly that many of his multiple personality patients have exhibited symptoms of possession. And this is one of the things I've discovered as a therapist is the number of people that I work with who actually happen to have another entity, another consciousness, another person connected to them. Still connected. Okay? Following them. Writing them. And that's what um, Dr. Allison started to talk about. He states, Repeatedly, I encountered aspects of these people's personalities and their ties that were not true alter personalities. Now, on delivering this lecture today, one of my difficulties and struggles is I could probably talk to you all day. I do a lecture on multiple personality disorder, schizophrenia, spirit possession disorder. It's an advanced lecture that I normally give to therapists. So I'm trying to think about how do I com compartmentalize this as like an introductory lecture without terrifying all of you. Because <laughs> how many of you are already getting a little, little, you know, spooked out? There we go. All right. Well, how often have you been talking to yourself and you go, so, hey, let's go and get, we need to get two. Who's we? You know, who are you talking to? That's what Dr. Allison is talking about. So I'm trying to kind of bring this in without terrifying everybody, but to give you an idea in an introduction to a fascin this topic, which I find fascinating. And many of these cases, Dr. Allison found it difficult to dismiss unusual and bizarre occurrences as just a delusion, as in a complete shift and change in personality. And that's one of the things I've also seen more working with these people. 
you'll see a change in personality to such a degree where you're looking at the person you're going, you're not who you were last time I saw you. It's like a different person inside. Well, where did it come from? How did it get in? That's what I'm talking about with protection. Again, we work on opening our eyes and opening up, but not being safe. So in the absence of any logical explanation, I found myself as a therapist having to believe in the possibility of spirit possession as in a person actually being encumbered and possessed with another consciousness. So I started having to ask myself as a therapist, how did it happen? How did it get in? When did the person lose control? Well, Arthur Goodham, an English psychiatrist who also claims to be a psychic, has been in practice for more than 50 years. And he refuses to consider the possibility of multiple personalities as a viable diagnosis. As in, that doesn't really exist. He thinks it's a condition purely of possession by one or more spirit entities. How many times have each of you spoke to a family member or a friend and gone, what's gotten into you? Okay. What has gotten into you today? Notice how that gets into our, our, our language in our lecture. Something has gotten into you. Well, it's gotten into you today. That's what Guthrie's talking about. That's what Dr. Allison is talking about. That's what William James is talking about. Is that maybe something does if we are not aware. God, I sound preachy. <laughs> I, I do. I feel like I sound so preachy. Um, he considers the condition to be possession by one or more spirit entities. As in, it's not just multiple in a broken consciousness. So with a broken consciousness, with a multiple personality, with a dissociative disorder, as a person's consciousness breaks apart, okay? Um, it's part of being post-traumatic, PTSD. Stage one PTSD, we're still there, something has happened. The second part is that consciousness breaks into a second, and a third, and a fourth. But kind of what's coming in here with what William James is talking about and Dr. Allison is talking about, and actually Dr. William Baldwin, who I was trained by, is that maybe somebody else's consciousness comes in too. You know that psychic reading you were trying to do? When you were sitting there getting a reading and listening to a grandmother, a great aunt, your highest spirit guide talking through to you? Well, what if those consciousnesses actually came in and stayed? That's what's going on here. That's what we're talking about. And that's what I mean when I talk about spiritual protection and being aware. As we open up these inner eyes, which is, should be safe and it's a good exploration, it is wonderful to learn and to open. 
But let's also be very aware and very alert of what might be happening. So, Dr. Goodrum considered the condition to be possession by one or more spirit entities, and that's what multiple personality disorder was, according to him. More than one person. Now, I think it's both. But he considers psychic influences or spirit possession to be cause of many kinds of illnesses, mental and physical. Now, on announcing that I would do this talk, a lot of it, believe it or not, is off the cuff. So I'm hoping we'll have some questions at the end. I got interested in this topic of spirit attachment and spirit influence. Told you my first client who worked on opening her psychic eye. Let me tell you a different client. This was fascinating. She was a nurse and had worked for years. Her husband was a heroin addict. I know we hear about this in the news all the time. I know that's like off the wall. We hear about this in the news now a lot with the whole opium, okay? But no, she lived in North Carolina. And her, her husband was a heroin addict. She never used herself, but she said she used to look at his face and there was such pleasure such serenity. And she wondered about it. Eventually, of course, he overdosed. So he killed himself. She said, never really wanted to use drugs before, but I really want to do heroin. I really, you're shaking your head. Do you see where I'm going with this? I really want it. She's like, I really want to do heroin. I'm really driven to do this. So the hypothesis here, is that her, or is that her husband stuck to her? And that's what we found in therapy. As in, you know how we started with an opening little meditation? I asked her to look within, and she found him with her. And that was her drive. So she picked up the drive from him, and it came from within. As in, she had a whole other consciousness connected to her. So these kind of psychic influences or spirit possession can be the cause of many physical illnesses that people have. One of the things I notice with many nurses and rescue. Now, all of my friends growing up, they all turned into rescue rangers. So all of my high school buddies, one guy works in the bomb squad, another guy's, I kid you not, CIA. Really, he is. Um, and a couple others run um, Virginia Beach Rescue. So I always talk to them about the importance of their language. Because when they're working the chest of a person who is dying on them and they're trying to keep them alive and keep them back, is to be careful about such phrases like, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't leave me. Instead of such phrases that maybe should be, be alert, be awake, come back. But not stay with 
me. Do you hear the invitation that a person is making with that? They're inviting another. In oh, you're laughing about that now because you know an example of it, don't you? Where somebody has invited somebody, hey, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Well, I've worked with a lot in the field of hypnosis counseling with weight loss. Anybody noticed how many nurses and doctors smoke and are themselves obese? Because maybe they're carrying with them other people, other consciousnesses, as in don't leave me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. That's what we're talking about. So hypnosis, spirit possession, and multiple personality disorder. Well, it's interesting to note that these three subjects, hypnosis, spirit possession, multiple personality disorder, are very prominent initially, and then somehow faded into obscurity, forgotten by modern science. Except when we work with this topic, we get changes in people, as in to get them to become aware of who they are. That inner voice and talk a little bit about hypnosis here. This is a basic of hypnosis. Right now, while I'm talking to you, you have a voice in your head that's making a running commentary on everything that I'm saying. It's called your operator voice. Everybody has one. It is your inner author, your inner historian. Anybody here have more than one voice in their head? <laughs> and that, have you ever questioned that voice and went, who, who are you? And why are you talking to me? Yeah. See, that's what I'm talking about. We have multiple consciousnesses. So, who is that voice inside your head, if not you? And who else is in there talking to you? It's just making yourself aware to a question. Hey, what's talking on inside of my head? Who's talking inside of my head? So, Hypnosis was, in, was actually accepted, believe it or not, in 1958 by the American Medical Association and recommended that all physicians learn hypnosis in 1958. It's kind of been pushed to the side and forgotten. But the treatment of spirit possession continued quietly through the years without much publicity. But it's never stopped. And to me, that's what's fascinating. Anybody here ever read the Bible? If you look at most of Christ's healings, according to Dr. Baldwin, he actually went through the book and measured all of it. About 78% of any healing was getting rid of the spirit was getting, you know, you're nodding your head over there, was getting rid of a negative spirit, a dark spirit within them. Okay? Getting rid of the spirits. So the connection between spirit possession and multiple personality disorder was brought back into the public and the professional awareness by Dr. Allison in his book, he included 
a chapter entitled Possession and the Spirit World. He described the effects of spirit interference as in these other consciousnesses whispering to us throughout the day and being around us. as actually affecting how we act every day. So what they're trying to bring to an awareness is maybe all of this is real. And if all of this is real, how many times have you ever questioned the voice in your head and went, are you mine? Or who are you? And why are you giving me such bad advice? How many of you have had a voice in your head that just gives you terrible advice? All right, so have you ever questioned why are you giving me bad advice and who are you? Instead of taking control of that inner voice and recognizing that inner voice is mine. So I can control it. How many of you have been able to get that inner voice in your head to shut up? As in a moment of silence. I hear you giggling. <laughs> That's what they're talking about here. So it's considered an expert in the field. Many people looking at multiple personality disorders suddenly run into multiple consciousnesses. Now, the topic of this lecture is spiritual protection, okay? Consciousness and protection. How many Claire's do I have in here? Who's a Claire? What do we have? Claire Audient, Claire Volt. What, what, what's your Claire? What? All of them. them Claire Audient, Claire Voyant. So everything I'm talking about, you've seen. You just see stuff constantly. How do I? How do I? You know. So you've always. How long have you been open? When I was a child, I stopped during my high school years. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to cut it off? Um, exercise. Exercise. Okay. Meditation helps. Meditation helps. I like what um, J.K. Rowling says. Chocolate. Chocolate helps. <laughs> no, after the, the torment, after the Dementor went after Harry Potter, he's like, here, eat this. What is it? It's chocolate. What? It helps. I often tell people after I do these lectures and we got all mental, go for a walk. Go outside. Who else here is a Claire? What kind of a Claire are you? The whole gambit. The whole gambit? Yeah. Clairaudient, clairvoyant? Since I was a baby. Yeah, yeah. How tough is that to be Claire of everything? It was brutal because I grew up in a very Catholic Whew. strict and went to Catholic schools and the nuns treated me like I was this Ponzi. Yes. I could see stuff. You're right, right. Thank and you. which which means you're of course I was Diabolical. Yeah. yeah, you're diabolical because you see stuff and you're aware of stuff. But maybe this is just a natural state of being for us. Maybe these kind of extrasensory perceptions are normal and we just repress. But when we open them up, how do we also control them? Still working on that. Well, that's what I'm going to help you with today. We're going to end with a little thing I hope will help you a little bit more on that, okay? Because on opening up, okay, again, I'm going under the hypothesis that all of this is real. And I'm not crazy, and you're not crazy, and you're not crazy, and it's all real. And sometimes you really can feel another person's emotions. Sometimes you really do sense them. I don't think when it comes to terms like the sixth sense, 
I think the sixth sense is that sense of emotion. This is the metaphor I like to give people, okay? If I'm sitting in this room and the room smells just fine, and then a person comes in and sits down next to me, and the room stinks, it's not me. It might be them, okay? So maybe you're perceiving them. And maybe the same is with emotion. Have you ever been happy? Having a great day and then somebody walks in and then suddenly you are depressed and sad? And you don't know why? Maybe it's not you. Think of the body odor metaphor. Maybe that sadness you're feeling is not yours. Maybe you're just reading their sadness. Maybe you're just feeling their sadness and maybe we need to take a moment and go, gee, I'm reading them and I need to pull me back and pull me back within. Does that make sense? To pull myself back in so I know what's me and I know what's you. So, protection. Based on Casey's readings. Now, I've been talking about here, I'm using words like spirit possession and multiple personalities. Anybody here a little bit creeped out? Anybody a little, little, little freaked? Okay. Casey has some basic things to talk about protection. And I like them. Rituals are important. Now, when I say rituals are important, I was trained by a guy named Dr. Bill Baldwin, who wrote a book on spirit releasement therapy. And I teach at the higher levels of our hypnosis program here at the ARE. I teach spirit releasement and how to deal with it. Spirit releasement, depossession, okay? The first time I opened up my office as a therapist, believe it or not, was as a depossession therapist. I have gotten referrals from ministers, psychiatrists, psychologists, court of last resolve. We've tried everything with this person, so we're going to send them to you and see if you can do anything, and I've had success. But rituals are very important. Now, I'm referencing back to my trainer, Dr. Baldwin. Because while he trained me in releasement therapy and how to do a clinical depossession, he said he could get the results by reading the phone book. He said, I could open up the phone book and just read the phone book. I'll get the same results because I believe belief. You got it? I believe that what I'm saying is going to work. Belief. So, protecting yourself from external influences, protecting yourself from entities, you know, whoever this is you're giving a reading to or doing a reading? Well, Casey has a couple of very basic things. First off, Casey says, emeralds? Believe it or not, emerald. Emerald seems to, is, protects the heart. Lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli. And yeah, you're laughing about that because that's from several of Casey's readings. Okay, yeah, I have a I have a bear I wear on my neck. It's a lapis. And the funny thing is, is I've been watching it break apart. It's a stone, but my body's been absorbing it over the last 10 years. It just kind of gets a little fuzzier every year because the body seems to do it. But Casey talks about that. Other rituals. How many of you have done smudging? Okay. How about this? 
This is an old way to protect oneself from spirits in the house. My boy was tormented, by the way. We, I adopted my son at nine. I got married. And he came from a very difficult environment. Very difficult, violent. And he often, often had nightmares and was terrified. So I gave him a very old ritual to make him feel better. Salt. Now here, I know you're laughing, but here's what's interesting about salt, okay? It's an electrolyte. So, if we do have spirit, we do have consciousness, when you're outside of the body, what is it? Well, we can read it on EEG, can't we? Why can we read consciousness on EEG? Because it is electrical. So, you take an electrolyte. It's an old tradition of putting it on your threshold, putting it on your doorways, over your shoulder. Well, by the way, the, you throw salt over your shoulder, it's done with your left handed because the devil is on your left side. Um, sinistral, sinister. So, you're throwing salt in the devil's eye. But that's, that is still part of it, though. So, on one hand, it's just a ritual. My boy's putting down salt, and boy, we go through a lot of salt. <laughs> but he did it outside of his bedroom door. I mean, there was always like this little line. We vacuum it up on, you know, the weekends. But he put down this little line of salt because it made him feel better because it was something to do. The ritual. So, did his mental tormenting stop? because of the salt or because of the ritual? And I think it was because of maybe both, but probably the ritual. Probably the ritual, which was also well, pretty much harmless. You know. So, simple things, smudging, is the smudging when you're burning sage really driving off spirits? Or is it just making you feel better because you found something to do to make them go away? <laughs> you found a ritual to make them go away. Hmm? Yeah, well, you said it right there. Believe. I believe it works. So, of course it works. Why does it work? Because you believe. My aunt wants you to know that she's not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Is your aunt with you today? Always. <laughs> well, that's okay. Okay? And she doesn't have to go anywhere as long as you welcome her and you have a good relationship with her. Yeah, she's perfect. <laughs> well, but see, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about being Claire. Is... Once you recognize that voice or that other entity or that reader, are you friends with them? Oh, yeah. Because I, I speak with a lot of my guides. I, I'm an amazing cook, but I don't know how to cook. Grandma knows how to cook. One of my, one of my personal guides is called Grandma, and she knows how to cook. I made a shepherd's pie last weekend, and my wife is like, when did you learn how to cook that? I'm like, I didn't. Because I just listened. Right. Okay. But do you have a good relationship with? And that's the point. So the point is, are you in a good relationship with that inner voice, that inner part? Because it might just actually be another part of your consciousness. That, you know, what you consider to be your aunt might just be you. Maybe. But are you in a cooperative relationship with it? Are you in control? Or do you feel like it's controlling you? So as long as you feel like you're in control, okay? And that's the whole thing on rituals. Rituals are <laughs> what we do to go, shh, okay? To hush those external voices, to hush that psychic eye that we've worked on and on and on. Remember my opening story, 10 years meditating? 
to open up one's inner eye and never working on an off switch. So, smudging, salt, holy water. It works. Belief, meditation, prayer. Casey on protection. Now, Casey said, first off, that he did not be born into the life to do what he did. Casey said it took many lifetimes to prepare, to be ready to do what he did. So it wasn't reckless. It wasn't just opening up. Okay? So he took many lifetimes to get ready to open up and to do what he did. Now, Casey used hypnosis. This is why I love hypnosis and why I teach it. Is he used hypnosis to get into that state. So he would put himself into that conscious state. And then Casey and this is how I do my regressions for those of you who have gone to some of my group regressions. Talked about rising up, up and out of the body, and then moving into consciousness. Now, as he moved up into consciousness, before he got to what he called the Akashic Record, he warned of the gray place. You're nodding your head. Yeah, he said as he went through that gray place, do not look left or right. Don't look at any of it. Move beyond and move through. So I think my words of caution here on avoiding dangerous behaviors is don't get caught up in that gray place. Because I think that happens a lot. I see you nodding your head as a Claire. People start opening up, they start seeing a Claire, they start seeing a thing and they get stuck. And they get stuck in the gray area. And when they get stuck in the gray area, they get lost. They, they don't vibrate as high anymore and I think that they kind of get stuck and we can't breathe about that. Right, and how do we, and so as a, you know, as a therapist or as other workers in the Claire, how do we pull them back? Mm -hmm. moment to break that cycle and with their spirit, music, dancing, a joke, whatever. Whatever's going to make them smile to break whatever they're thinking about. And to try to move away from that other consciousness. Exactly. Back into their own. Back into their own. It's being in control. Being in control of your mind and your body. So, meditation and prayer. And that's why I open with a meditation and that's why we will close with meditation. Now, Casey warns, you said you're a Claire, you're a Claire. Does anybody here do readings? If you ever are, anybody here gone to a reading or had a medium read for them? Okay. Casey specifically says, avoid alcohol. Yes. Specifically. I like this in Gone with the Wind, okay? Anybody seen that movie, Gone with the Wind? Careful, Katie Scarlet. The spirits be in that. Because her father caught, him, caught her taking a drink. Careful, the spirits. Notice how we even label alcohol as spirits. Be careful of the spirits. They're powerful. And that goes beyond and before any of the other mind-altering substances, which Lord knows we have plenty of them. So, when we talk about this, Casey warns against that because it weakens the body and opens it to possession. As in, it weakens your aura. It weakens your aura, which breaks it down 
which leaves you open. Let me give you a metaphor in the 19th century. I thought this was fascinating. In the 19th century, they created a microscope. So they saw for the first time ever germs. And germs are everywhere. Your hands, by the way, are covered with germs. Your feet are covered with germs. They are everywhere. They've always been everywhere. And you're fine. Why? Because your body has an immune system to fight them. Opening your spiritual eye. Opening up your clair. Suddenly you see and recognize that we're not alone. Well, we've never been alone. Nothing has changed. So don't let it freak you out. Just listen and be aware. Does that make sense? Just listen and be aware. It's, it's always been there. So when we discover germs, yes. But the same is here with your inner eye as you open your inner eye. Open it. Look, ask specific questions, and close it. But remember to close it. And that's the thing, is how many people walk around. Courtesy. This is one of my biggest soapboxes. Courtesy. Now, I got my doctorate at Virginia Tech, did my postdoctorate work, Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Pretty big name. In dermatology, of all things for a psychologist. Four, four, different, four different research internships in dermatology. <laughs> now, this is the metaphor I want to give you, especially for those of you who are working on opening up your clair or opening up that psychic eye, or becoming more psychic. I worked with the head of residency, top doctor in our country. And he did this to his new secretary. Okay? I'm just going to randomly pick somebody, so I'm going to pick you randomly because you're up front. He said this to her. Come see me after work. I'll take care of your acne. Oh. How did that affect her? That's heartbreaking. That's so rude. I it's courtesy. Could he see that she had acne? Yes. Did he know the diagnosis? Yes. Did she ask for the diagnosis. No. So I found her in the office crying because somebody noticed and she went to so much effort that morning to cover it up with makeup so that nobody would notice. Okay? And I picked you because you have great skin so you don't have to worry about that. Um, <laughs> but it so overwhelmed her. Why? For him it was easy to see. Okay? For him, it was easy to see. It was nothing for him to see. And it was nothing for him to diagnose or say, hey, we'll take care of that. But to her, she wasn't ready. And that's the thing about protection and opening one's eyes. It's rude to point out what you see and last asked. And that's why I keep looking at my people who said they're Claire. Because we do see things. Being a Claire, you see things. I'm super intrusive. Yeah. <laughs> but if they haven't asked you, you don't want to tell them. Well, some people I want to tell because I want to help them. Mm -hmm. Because I legitimately see issues down the road. That right. I'm help, but I'm intrusive and I'm working on it. Right. So, and, and you see when I get my point about courtesy, it's that we notice that things they don't notice. And that's the danger of opening up one's consciousness. Once you open up your consciousness, you see things 
that you might not want to see. You just might see something you don't want to see. I think everybody thinks that being psychic is great, and I think they don't understand that sometimes... It sucks. It sucks. If you know everything, <laughs> that people don't tell people. Like, that's not pleasurable all the time. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, well, no, no. No, I mean, and I, I have to be careful because also I'm a therapist. So I can also read... Plus, I have knowledge and book knowledge. Because, you know, the last thing you want to do is walk by somebody and go, you know your husband's gay. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, you did not know your... I mean, and then they go, oh my God, that explains everything. That explains why we haven't had sex for 10 years. You know. want to have a really long conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like yeah. I didn't mean to yeah. Oops, sorry. Just didn't, didn't, didn't mean to divulge that. But here's why it's important when I talk about courtesy and the importance of it. And one of my whole reasons for giving this lecture on spiritual protection. When I was 15, it was the first time I came to the ARE. Came here for a lecture and it was interesting. It was on past lives. But on my way out, a guy who was about your age, okay, a little bit older than me, a little gray, grabbed me by the arm and said, you know, you'd understand your life a lot better if you looked at your past life in Masada. Anybody know what Masada was? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's where, you know, they had this whole protective fort and held off the Romans for over 10 years. And then they all committed suicide. Well, you know, at 15, I wasn't ready to learn that. It was too much. It overwhelmed me. Now, was he psychically aware? Probably. Was he accurate? Yeah, I think he got the reading. I think he nailed it. Did I ask for it? Nope. Was I ready for it? Nope. And that's what I'm talking about with courtesy. Make sure you get permission. You know, um, one of the things I think is interesting is the Native American perspective. Now, this is from Barlow, Drew, and Durand, which is a except, human exceptionality book. Uh, one of the courses I teach is in, in special ed. One of the things Barlow, Drew, and Durant talk about is the Native American. This is in Navajo perspective. If you're blind, you're not blind until the doctor says you're blind. <coughs> you're not deaf until they say you're deaf. You don't have a learning disability until they put that medicine upon you. So, the answer is not you've had a stroke and you're not going to see again. It's going to be difficult to get your vision back. You hear what I'm saying? It's going to be take a lot of work for you to get your hearing back. If you've had a stroke and half of your face is all, it's going to take a lot of work to get it back. But the actual, in that belief system, is when you say it, you've put it upon them. So, when we talk about a clairvoyant eye, be careful of what you're putting on a person. Does that make sense? What are you putting upon them? And that's the whole thing. And I, say, and I, I think we've kind of connected here, and that is, and you have a reading for somebody, but once you give it to them, you've put it upon them. So make sure they ask for it first. Make sure they're ready for it first. My Lord, I was terrified that I would not have enough to talk about for an hour and a half, and I'm already looking, I'm running out of time. So, be careful about voodooing other people. How many of you have ever played with a Ouija board? Okay. Let's talk science again. This is on being careful and protection. Let's talk science. 
if I take this finger and I stick it in that light socket, and I stick it in that other light socket, I'm going to be electrocuted. Why? Because I'm a conductor. The electricity will flow through me and boom. Okay? So, if you played with a Ouija board, let's set the hypothesis that it's real. Okay? Now, how deep or how close does a person have to be to tell you a thing? Hmm. Right. How close do they have to be to move your hand? How deep into your brain and your consciousness do they have to be to speak and use your voice? So when you're moving that little Ouija board, how deep are you inviting something that you don't know in? And on top of that, while you're inviting that in, there's kind of an unwritten agreement that it would leave. But what if it doesn't? How many of you saw the movie The Exorcist? Okay, well, it's actually based on a real story, and the real story actually started with a Ouija board. Captain Jack. Captain Jack was a friendly character that came through the Ouija board, but stayed. So let's pose that hypothesis that it's real. So think about it. Automatic writing, channeling. One of the things Edgar Cayce said, and I love this, and I want you to remember this. If there's anything you take away from this, please take this with you today. Edgar Cayce said, just because a person no longer has a body doesn't mean they suddenly know more than you. Just because they're no longer in a body doesn't mean they're suddenly wise. Because you know, if you were stupid in this life, and you're dead, you're still <laughs> stupid. <laughs> so just because they don't have a body doesn't mean they know more than you. And just because you hear that external voice doesn't mean they know more than you. So what I'd like to warn people about is, well, it's okay to pursue and look at these kind of psychic developments. You might want to know what that entity is before you let them in. Have you questioned them? Have you interviewed them? Do you know who they are? Are you friends with them? And do you know they're going to leave? So that's what I'm talking about with Casey. So protection and belief. Well, affirm protection. So when I work as a therapist, which was really interesting because I worked like I had a client every hour. So every hour on the hour, client, boom, 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 boom. The nurses I worked with would come up to me and they would go, you know, it's weird, you work with hypnosis and you smoke. I'm like, I don't smoke. They're like, why do you go outside every hour? I'm like, I go outside to ground myself in between each client. It's a grounding meditation. It's what I opened with. It's what I want to close with, is to make sure on your awareness of what all these things are, is to center yourself and to make it very clear to the universe that while you might want to explore your consciousness and explore your mind and search out there, you're also going to set limits. As in, this is where it begins and this is where it ends. This is mine, that is yours. Okay? So, I want to make sure we have a few minutes for questions, but let's close with a little meditation. Okay? 
Because what we opened up with is a protective shield. And that's what I'm talking about, is learning how to create your protective shield. And it's so easy to do. You know you can do this, I do this in my car before I come here. As in I pull up, I park, and then I focus. So take a moment again. And it's all metaphor. But take a moment and draw your consciousness into your heart. So take a deep breath and close your eyes. Picture in your heart a light. Light is a strong metaphor. In the beginning there was darkness and then there was light and it was good. So focus on that light. Create it. Pretend if you have to and it's okay. If you pretend and just pretend there's a little candle there of your light. This is your mind-body connection. The connection of your mind to your body and to your understanding of creation, however that might be. So breathe life into that light. And allow that light to expand and fill your heart. Now with your mind's eye, spread that light out and let it fill your entire chest cavity. And, that let, and let it move down from your arms and legs from the top of your head to the tip of your toes. From fingertip to fingertip. Now expand that light to within arm's length of your body. Above, below, to the left and right, all around. I want you to picture an impenetrable shield of light around you. And mentally, this is from Dr. Bill Baldwin, and I want you to mentally think about this proclamation of space and purpose. I take my power back from any being who wants or attempts to attach to me. This is my space. I claim dominion here. I refuse permission for any spirit or entity to approach me or to attach to me in any way. This is my body and my space. It is the precious physical gift that allows me to experience light. I will allow nothing physical or non-physical to enter my body without my permission. This is my right. This is my space. This is my person. This is my body. And I am in control. Think about that in a deeply personal way. What does it mean to be able to say that I am in control of my mind and my body and anything around me? Now, I'm going to count from five to one. And let's bring you out of this light. And remember, you can practice this light meditation whenever you need to. But at five, I want you to remember everything you've experienced. Four, be happy and satisfied. It's been a fun morning. Three, allow your subconscious to solve a problem. It might not even be the problem you came here to work on, but there it is. Fixed. 
two, allow your mind and body to begin to return to normal. And when you see the number one appear in your mind's eye in the next few seconds, allow yourself to become wide awake, refreshed, and feeling good with a sense of well-being. and wide awake and feeling good. Thank you, that's what I had for you today. I hope you found it enlightening. I hope you found it interesting. And I'm available for questions, should anybody have any questions. Other than that, have a great day. Thank you very much. <laughs>